We could figure out why we come. What have you come here for? And we said, we've come here to put God's words in a book and teach you how to read so you can know what God wants to tell you. And they'd say, yeah, but why did you come here? And so we'd try again, you know, put God's words in a book and teach you to read. And they'd say, yeah, but why did you come here? You know, we tell them again. Nobody can understand that. They told us later they decided among themselves why we'd come. They said one of two reasons. Either we'd come somehow to get rich. Uh, maybe they were going to sell their language in America because why else were we writing it down? <laughs> Or else, they said, perhaps they've come looking for husbands because they don't have any. <laughs> Joe, tell me about your Malang Al father. An amazing man. Yeah. I loved him very, very much. I've said that he's taught me almost everything I know about personal evangelism and working with people. Uh, I can remember when I would be too much in a hurry for people to make that decision to follow God. And he'd be troubled with me and he'd say my daughter don't you see they're asking questions they're in the process of believing let them ask their questions let them fight their battles and go through their struggles so they so that they can believe firmly our Belangyao daddy told us that if we would eat more rice we'd learn to speak Belangyao better and you know he was right Anne and I would go down through our little village. It was on terraces, just like everything else in our world. And we'd climb up the little bamboo ladders to their houses that sit on stilts with little grass roofs and hand-hewn lumber walls. And we'd sit on the floor with the rest of them. You could look down through the slats in the floor and see the pigs and chickens underneath. And it's kind of dark and smoky inside. And we would sit there in front of their open fire and eat the best rice in all the world with our fingers, drink their homegrown coffee, and we learned how to talk belong out. It's not all we learned. We also learned about what belong outs are afraid of. We found out about the evil spirits. We found out that when the men go off to the forest to get firewood, if they happen to accidentally step on an evil spirit's house, they come home, they'll have to sacrifice. They step on an evil spirit's child, It'll even be worse. And the spirits have ways to let you know when you've offended them. And you've got to sacrifice a pig, a chicken. Perhaps a rainbow appears in the sky. It strikes terror in the heart of everyone. And they're afraid. They've got to sacrifice something. If you're building a house, you tear it down flush to the ground. Even if you're tying on just the very last shelf in your house, you tear it down. It's very frightening. The birds, bird omens, control their lives. I saw a man right next door to us came home three days in a row trying to go to the forest and the birds made him come back every day. It was another tribe in the Philippines that told me why people have to obey the bird omens. The Tabali people, they said they used to have a written language. They used to be wise long time ago. But then they said one day when the parents were off the field working, the kids got into the little wooden trunk where that written language was kept and they were playing with it. The pages of the book fell through the slats on the floor and birds came and ate those pages. The Tabali not only lost their written language, they lost their wisdom. And they were forced to obey the bird that ate the pages of that book. And they obey the omens of that particular kind of bird. But that's not the end of the story. You see, legends told the Tabalis that someday they'd get their book back. One day when a couple of our colleagues were doing some translation work, an old man came up on the porch and he said to them, is it true you're writing Tabali words? He said, yeah. Are you the ones that are bringing us back our book? And they said, yes. Five years ago, the Tabali got their completed book. In that tribe of over 80,000 people, there's 150 churches. Joe, tell me about the importance of prayer in your ministry. You know, I don't think I really understood how important it was to have the folks back home pray. And after I'd been in Belangao for the first five years and met such an incredibly strong brick wall, and I came home, uh, I understood in a brand new way what it meant to have people pray. It's, it's an impossible sort of thing, this uh, warfare that we're in. And when I gave the job to my home churches to pray, things turned around. 
You know, when I came home after five years in Belongau on my first furlough, I was probably the most frustrated missionary that that little church in California had ever seen. Exactly two people believed. I went to that church, and I went to two other little churches, uh, country churches they were, close to my hometown. You probably didn't even know there's any country churches left in California. One of those country churches just got a new outhouse last year. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. I dumped the whole load on them. And you know something? I found out something. You can't do the job by yourself. You have got to have people praying for you. You've got to have a team behind you. A tree is no good without a root system. Well, my root system in a brand new way was born. It was no longer, dear God, please bless Joe wherever she's at and whatever she's doing. They took up the burden. When I came back uh, after my year of furlough, first thing I did when I got back was hand my belong out daddy a copy of the book of 1 John to correct. He started to read it. He didn't get halfway through. And he said, my goodness. He said, this stuff is good. <laughs> he said, why people would believe this if they could just hear it. I gulped and I said, well, what are we going to do so they can hear it? And you know, when the folks at home start to pray, it's not just the belong outs that get changed. The missionary stumbles on some pretty important things too. You know, I didn't know that children don't teach their fathers. Well, but, you know, fathers can certainly be asked to correct something. That's what they're for. And fathers, when you have a problem, they're the ones you go to. I said, what are we going to do so they can hear it? He went out. Didn't say anything to me because fathers don't have to report to their children. A few days later, came back in, and he had a whole crowd of people. They sat down, and he says, here we are. Teach us. For the first time in six years, I had the floor teach you what? He had been thumbing through a New Testament I had sitting on my table. You know it's on page one of a New Testament? He says, you mean this thing's got a genealogy in it? We have three words for genealogy, mind you, in case you didn't think that was important. I said, oh yeah, just skip that and you can get to the good stuff. He says, you mean this is true? And they wanted to know where did people come from? Well, then where did sin come from? Well, how about Satan? Where did he come from? And they started asking questions. They asked floods of questions. All day long, they'd ask questions. And it went for week after week. And pretty soon, they were asking, now, what is that you tell God when you want to become one of his children? And I'd give them a little prayer to pray. Never will forget one guy. He goes down right on the spot, and he prays. He comes up, and he says, is it okay if we tell this to other people? You know, they started to believe. The Balanga started to believe by the dozens. But you know, this created all kinds of trouble with the evil spirits. It began to be that so when a person said he wanted to believe, his whole life would fall apart until he would sacrifice. And this got to be the point to the point where I thought I couldn't take it any longer until the day when we saw before our very eyes a knockdown, drag out, power confrontation between God and the evil spirits and two women the spirits tried to kill so they wanted to believe they could not kill and then people came by the fifties, by the hundreds to find out who is this God who has more power than the evil spirits and a church was born in Belongau. You know, with this church, it was something that was bigger than I was, something that money couldn't buy, something that was worth everything I had. And I tell you, I wanted those little children to grow. But you know, there are no lone rangers in any of this kind of work. It's not just a translator that makes a translation. You've got to have a whole team. We have a tremendous team. You've got to have school teachers and pilots and mechanics and secretaries and computer, the whole thing. And those people were in it, right, with me. They pulled me out of the ditch more than once. And John Kyle pulled me out of probably the worst ditch I was ever in. You see, I was praying to the point where I'd wake up at night and say, God, I don't care what you have to do. I don't care what it costs. Teach these people how to pray in depth. And that cost me within an inch of my life. 
But do you know that the worst thing that could ever happen to you or me is not to die? Every single one of you would die given a cause big enough. The worst thing that could ever happen to you is not have a cause big enough worth dying for. And I had it. Joe, you mentioned that you came within an inch of losing your life. What happened? That happened really couched again around the whole idea of prayer. You know, Belanghouse, in the beginning, when they started to believe, they wouldn't pray. Now, they believed, mind you, but they didn't pray. And I used to wake up in the night and just plead with God, teach these people how to pray. Make them pray. And I remember finally it came, and I said, God, I don't care what you have to do. Make these people pray. About a month later, I was in a helicopter, a jolly green giant. That's something I think is supposed to hold about 10 tons of cargo as a Marine, U.S. Marine helicopter. And we were taking in cargo to build a hospital in Belongau. And I was riding along with my Belongau brother and the doctor. And just as we, before we were going to land, the helicopter crashed, tipped over, dumped all the tons of cargo on top of us. And when we woke up, underneath all the cargo was pinned in upside down, caught on fire. When the Belongau's found out we were inside, they somehow put the fire out. And after half an hour or so, we were able to start digging us out. Broken, bleeding, the doctor was dead. Uh, my brother was uh, protected, sort of, between the two of us. And that night was maybe the longest night of my life mm. and the most painful, mm. but in some senses, almost the most exciting. Because Belongau's, they sewed up my heads and tried to poke the bones back a little bit as best they could and washed me off, poured water in my eyes all night long that had blown up into two great bug-eyed things. And all night long gathered around and prayed mm -hmm. one after the no another until mm -hmm. daybreak god don't let her die the book's not done yet well what do you do with a church on your hands well i'll tell you what i did you skip over to the pastoral epistles it's what you need and you start translating i was working with my belong out daddy in first timothy and we got and didn't get very far along in, in chapter two it was we came across a verse where paul says to timothy I will that men everywhere should pray. And my daddy thought that that's what that meant. And do you know, that night at supper time, he says, <clears throat> I will be the one to pray tonight. And that was the beginning of the Belongau's praying. And you know, it, oh, Sundays, we would have all days of questions and answers. And some Sundays I couldn't be there. I'd argue, I'd plead, I'd beg the men. i said, you guys, I will help you, and you be the ones to lead the Bible studies. They would not. Keep translating into Timothy. Came across a verse where Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I don't allow women to teach men. <laughs> My daddy didn't, didn't miss a breath. We just kept going. At the end of the day, he says, uh, now what is that we're going to study on Sunday? I suppose he was curious. He didn't tell me what he had in mind because fathers don't report to their children. I told him. Sunday morning, he stood up. He says, my daughter here knows more about this than I do. But we found in the Bible where it says that women aren't supposed to teach men, so I guess I have to be the one. And that was the end of my career. <laughs> Your Belangal father is now with the Lord, is that right? Yes. Uh-huh. With the Lord. In you must have uh, felt a tremendous loss when when he went to be with the Lord? I think it was when I found out how he died that I was able to give him to God. Hmm. And uh, that was, he had uh, suddenly died. It was very sudden. Uh, he lasted through the night. And finally, he called his wife about 2.30 in the morning and said, sit me up. And he looked up and he said, Lord Jesus, it's enough now. You can take me. And he died. Is that right? And when he died, the earth shook. There was a big earthquake all over Belangau. They all said, that's when Kana went into heaven. Yeah, about that. And they'd been needing rain, and the next day it rained, and they said, 
he asked the Lord Jesus for some rain and he sent it to us. Well, listen, even I was getting smart. <laughs> I knew that the thing you needed to do as soon as you get this stuff translated is you need to get it out into their hands. And so I, who hate to type, started out...